Hi. I'd like to thank you all for being here tonight. It means uh, so much to me and all of the other speakers backstage. There's been a lot of uh, hard work that gets put into SciTalks every year, and we're all just very appreciative of you coming. Uh, like Dr. C said, I'm Allie or Allison. I go by many names. Hey, you works typically. Um, but I'm a human in biology and psychology double major because sanity is overrated. And, um, but I'm graduating in May, so yay, that's exciting. Uh, once I've completed my undergrad, um, I hope to go to graduate school um, for a clinical neuroscience um, degree. And hopefully I can get up on my soapbox every day and uh, bore a bunch of undergraduate students. Um, but enough about me, because that's not really why you're here. I'd like to start off with a story. Um, my mom is a special education teacher, and one of her students a long time ago uh, came in for a preschool screening, and he started um, exhibiting these signs and symptoms. He was diagnosed with ASD, or Autism Spectrum Disorder. And then when he was about 22, he started exhibiting these signs and symptoms. Voices were telling him to kill his mother. He had flat affect or no emotion at all. And he had disorganized behavior. And then he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. And I found this fascinating because I didn't know how someone could be diagnosed with two disorders. It was very weird to me that it's a term called comorbidity, but I didn't know that at the time. I'm like, how can someone have both of these things? Or, uh, you know, how do, how do we get there? And this is what kind of led me to the field of clinical neuroscience, which is exactly um, what this field answers or tries to. It's a relatively new field. It's only about 15 years old, and it's essentially the bridge between psychology and the health fields. Specifically, it's the study of neurobiological disorders and clinical neuroscientists research novel ways to treat, prevent, and diagnose these disorders. A couple of ways they do this is by an EEG, which on the top, on the top left of the screen is an EEG. It's essentially a cap of electrodes that you can fill with a gel, and then it, it um, picks up the time signals of when a person answers a stimulus. And then on the top right of the screen is a printout in, of an fMRI scan. If you've never had an, or been in an MRI, it's essentially a tube that you lie down in, and it measures brain activity via blood flow. This is a way to look at where the brain um, is answering to that set of stimuli. And this is what we do, these are some of the methods that we use to study clinical neuroscience. Behaviors are diagnosable, but behavior begins in the brain. So how do we get these behaviors? Lots of literature states that it's because you have a genetic predisposition. Some research suggests that it's due to developmental challenges, such as the hypoxic state, which is shown over here, when the umbilical cord is wrapped around the, the neck of a fetus in utero. Some other literature states that it's a combination of these and that due to a pre genetic predisposition, you are more likely to suffer these developmental challenges. Some say it's due to chemical and structural or changes that are abnormal. Sometimes it's the whole quantity of these, and sometimes a person can be diagnosed with schizophrenia or another disorder, and they have none of these that have happened to them. There are typically, um, and some, um, the truth is that we just don't know why this happens yet. But like I stated previously, disorder that I'm specifically interested in is schizophrenia. The DSM-5 criteria for this disorder is the presence of hallucinations, delusions, and or disorganized speech, accompanied by disorganized or catatonia and or negative symptoms for at least a month. And that's a mouthful. But in order to be diagnosed with schizophrenia, you have to have all of these. The DSM-5 is what is known as a categorical approach to diagnosis and is what healthcare workers use to diagnose individuals. And that's just how it is. But from a clinical neuroscience standpoint, I'm interested not in the diagnosis, but how we get to the behaviors themselves. This is a model of equifinality versus multifinality and what is and is one of the ways of a more dimensional approach. 
So let's use the example of PTSD. In an equifinality model, a person could become diagnosed with PTSD due to being a war veteran, or from being maltreated as a child, or a number of other things. But in short, um, there's many different ways to be diagnosed with PTSD. From a multifinality standpoint, you could have one person that's maltreated as a child, and then they could be diagnosed with anxiety disorders, depression, PTSD. There's just a multitude of outcomes that they could have. So what I'm trying to say is that disorders aren't really cut and dry, and you don't have to have it or you don't. What I'm trying to say is that we're all a little mad here, and that's okay. We're all just human. We all have some of these symptoms. We might not have others. You know, we're, it's, it's okay to be human. So taking a more dimensional approach to clinical neuroscience, I wanted to look at how many abnormal symptoms were present in a normative population using the EEG system in the lab. So last year, I tried this and I hooked up a bunch of participants to the EEG, and they took part in a neural timing task, which is called a, no, a go-no-go task, and before they came to the lab, they had to partake in a PANAS survey, which kind of looked like this. So they had to answer how many of these symptoms they had within the last two weeks, and then they had to rate how strongly they felt these symptoms. And then they took part in the go-no-go -go task. And I want us to try it, so please indulge me. So I want you to either clap or slap your leg when you see a letter. But if you see the letter X, don't do anything, OK? OK. OK, it's a little harder than it looks, right? OK, that's my point. OK. so. What they had to do was that after they um, completed the survey, they had to do that, but on a keyboard. And what I was testing was that if they had more symptoms that they stated on the PANS um, questionnaire, that they were going to do more poorly in that task. So basically, that task is testing inhibition, which is the, it's called the oh shit response. So the oh crap, I wasn't supposed to clap there. And people with more of these symptoms we're going to have a harder time and express more cognizant effort when they did that task. It was going to be harder for them, essentially. And that's exactly what I found, which is good. So this green line is the don't do anything part. It's the, if you see an X, don't do anything. And the blue line is if you see any other letter, do something. And you can see that these don't exactly line up. And the difference in amplitude is the more cognizant effort that you need to do the inhibition task. And what I did find was that people that did this on the, if they had more symptoms on the PANAS questionnaire that they did, they did express a harder time doing the inhibition part. This year, I'm trying it a little bit differently, but a similar approach. So I'm doing it with a schizotypal personality questionnaire instead of the PANAS scale. And I'm doing this because of my interest in schizophrenia, because it's getting a little bit closer to where schizophrenia is, but not quite. So I'll be asking questions like, have you ever had experience with the supernatural? I have little interest getting to know others. I sometimes jump quickly from one topic to another when speaking. So kind of, you know, I'm hoping that some of you are like, oh yeah, I express that sometimes, or no, that's not me at all. But some of us might express some of these more than others. And so I'm hoping um, that with the more symptoms that they have, that they're going to do similarly to last year. And the, um, they'll also be taking part in the Wisconsin card sorting task, which is also just another means of testing um, cognizant effort. And so hopefully I find similar um, findings to last year. And the value of clinical neuroscience is that hopefully one day through studies such as this, that we'll be able to answer the how and the why these behaviors arise. 
But before I get kicked off stage, um, I just want to give a special shout out to my husband, who is backstage with our daughter right now, <laughs> trying to get her to sleep. And um, I'd also really like to thank Dr. Cowell for always believing in me and the rest of the lab for helping me collect data. Thank you. <laughs>